Okay, so let us now move to a new topic. Again, another very important topic, which is the authority of hadith. And this has to do with, again, a core idea in hadith application. So what is the role of ahad hadith and mutawatir hadith in aqidah and sharia? And previously we had talked about the broad difference between hadiths which are mutawatir and hadiths which are ahad. And an example of mutawatir hadith is the number of rakahs in each prayer. Now, in general, scholars agree that mutawatir hadiths imply certainty. Remember, we had touched on this topic of certainty before. And therefore, they can be used to establish the pillars of faith as well as religious law. Therefore, no Muslim can think that dhuhr is three rakahs, for example. Because mutawatir hadith uh, implies certainty, a mutawatir hadith has full authority in terms of religious law with an authority just below the Qur'an. Now the question becomes, since most hadiths are ahad and not mutawatir, what is the role of sahih hadiths which are ahad? And this has been a topic of significant discussion among the scholars for centuries. And the details of the debate are beyond this introductory course. But we want to introduce you to the issues in the debate and uh, familiarize you with some of the different points of view. Now, before doing this, let's reintroduce a couple of terms which we used in the title to this slide. Regarding the religion as a whole, scholars often divide it into aqidah, which are the articles of belief, and sharia, which are the laws and the regulations. So, for example, belief in the hereafter is part of the aqidah. It's a requirement of the faith that Muslims believe in the hereafter, in the Day of Judgment. Conversely, how and when to perform tayammum, which, as you remember, is performed instead of wudu when water is not available, that's a matter of sharia. It's part of the religious regulations. And another two important terms are yaqeen, which is certainty, and dhan, which is probability of opinion, but without certainty. And a term that is used synonymously with yaqeen in, in the literature, in the hadith literature in this vein, is ilm. Ilm means knowledge, means certain knowledge, and so in this context would be synonymous with yaqeen and would be juxtaposed to dhan, which means probability of knowledge, but without certainty. Now, let's begin by making a broad statement. Let's say that most scholars believe that mutawatir hadiths assert certainty, while sahih ahad hadiths convey only dhan, a probability that the Prophet said it, but not absolute certainty. So based on this, a large body of scholars across different schools of thought have taken the position that ahad hadiths cannot be used to establish the aqidah, or the core articles of belief that define Islam, without which one is not considered a Muslim, because core beliefs have to be based on absolute certainty. Now, to be sure, this is not a unanimous opinion, but it is very strongly held, and it is the opinion that we will teach here. And so you see why it's important to talk about aqidah and sharia, and why it's important to talk about yaqeen, which is certainty, and dhan, which is probability. Now, we also want to point out that there are some scholars who disagreed, such as the great scholar Ibn Hazm, who believed that sahih ahad hadiths also convey yaqeen or certainty. Others have tried to take a more qualified position, saying that there can be some conditions under which sahih ahad hadiths can be considered to convey certainty, and we'll mention three of these. Number one, the hadiths appear in sahih al-Bukhari or sahih Muslim. Number two, the hadith is mashhur. Remember, mashhur means it comes with multiple chains of narration that contain at least three narrators at each level in the chain. 
So the chain right next to the Prophet, peace be upon him, means that the hadith needs to be narrated by at least three different companions. Then in the second level, uh, which is the level uh, of the tabi'un or the successors, again, there needs to be at least three different successors and so on. And that hadith is called a mashhur hadith and it is a subdivision of the ahad. And if you remember, we covered this in module one. And I bet you thought, hey, I'll never need these terms again. Well, look how they crop back up. Now, category three is that the hadith is more than gharib, means it has more than one chain of narration and at least two narrators at every level in the chain. But if the hadith at this point would be a aziz hadith, having two narrators at each level in the chain or two narrators at some level in the chain only, not three narrators at each and every level to make it mashhur, then the chains not only need to be sahih, but must consist of well-known imams and scholars. So those, in the opinion of some of the scholars, would be the three conditions under which a sahih ahad hadith can reach the level of yaqeen. So just to summarize, we have three opinions. The majority opinion, that sahih ahad hadiths convey dhan, probability that the Prophet said it, but not yaqeen, not certainty that the Prophet said it, so they cannot be used to establish the aqidah, the core articles of belief, without which a person is not a Muslim. The sort of opposite opinion held by scholars like Ibn Hazm is that if you have a sahih ahad hadith, it can convey yaqeen. The middle ground opinion is that there are conditions under which a sahih ahad hadith can, contain, can convey yaqeen, and they are the three conditions that we just talked about. There are sahih al-Bukhari or sahih Muslim, the hadith is not only ahad but mashhur, or if it is less than mashhur but more than gharib, that the chains, it is not only sahih, but the chains consist of well-known scholars and imams. Don't worry, even though that stuff is not on the slide, it is all in the syllabus. What is our position? Our position is to agree with the scholars who say that the aqidah or the core portion of belief in Islam has as its source the Quran and the mutawatir hadiths and that ahad hadiths do not mandate the aqidah. Okay, so that is the position we will be teaching. So, Again, for this section, you'll need to rely mostly on your syllabus, but everything I'll be saying here is in the syllabus. So let's look at a concrete example. There are widespread beliefs among Muslims about various signs of the coming of the Day of Judgment. This area is known as eschatology. Among these is the coming of Al-Mahdi, or the rightly guided one who will establish justice on earth, stand with Jesus, peace be upon him, when he returns to earth, and defeat the Masih al-Dajjal or the Antichrist. There are numerous hadiths about these facets in various hadith books. However, while there are many hadiths mentioning these facets, they are different hadiths and would be considered ahad narrations. Based on this, let's take a very specific and very controversial example to make our position clear. A large number of Muslims believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, was raised bodily by God unto himself, did not die, and is alive now, and will return at the end of days. There are multiple hadiths, as well as some possible interpretations of Quranic verses that point to this belief. However, when the Grand Rector of Al-Azhar University, Sheikh Mahmoud Shaltout, was asked whether someone who denies these things should be considered a kafir, who has left the religion of Islam by denying one of the central pillars of the creed, he replied a clear no. That position is also reportedly shared by several other great modern Islamic scholars, such as Muhammad Abdu, Rashid Rada, and Ahmad Mustafa al-Maraghi. Now, once again, we're not taking a position on the issue itself or objecting to this belief. But we are taking a position 
on the notion that this issue forms a core part of the Islamic creed, like belief in the messengers, the books, the angels, the day of judgment, etc. We believe that the evidence in this area are multiple hadiths with singular transmissions rather than a single mutawatir hadith, and we believe that this is not sufficient proof to form a cornerstone of aqidah wherein, so, wherein someone who denies it can no longer be considered a Muslim. So this would be a direct application of the point made by our classical scholars that ahad hadiths do not form a cornerstone of aqidah. Therefore, after looking at the evidence of the hadiths, if you believe it, then that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. If you're undecided, that's fine. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now, it's interesting to note that Sheikh Shaltut's opinion and fatwa that a person who denies this, that Jesus was raised bodily by God, is alive now and will return at the end of days, his opinion and fatwa that a person who denies this should not be considered a kafir raised a storm of controversy. His opinion is published in an Arabic journal called Al Risala. It's issue 462 from May 1942 for those who are interested. And his response to those who leveled charges of heresy against him, although he was Sheikh Al Azhar, was published in a lengthy article in Al Risala edition 514 in 1943. Now, in terms of Sharia, ah, the situation is reversed. The vast majority of scholars believe that Sahih Ahad Hadiths can be used to establish religious rules and practices, and in fact, obligate the Muslims to act upon them. Thus, a common phrase that can be seen in classical sources on Ilm al-Hadith is something like, Hadith al-Ahad yujibu al-Amal wa la yujibu al-Ilm. The Ahad narrations in the Sahih books obligate action but do not obligate knowledge. This typical saying is found, for example, in the book Al-Faqih wal Mutafaqih by the great scholar Al Khatib al Baghdadi, and he was a very famous Hadith scholar who died in 1071. Also, the early classical scholar Al-Qurtubi states, quote, Our colleagues and others have differed about the Ahad narration transmitted by Adl transmitter. Does it mandate both certain knowledge and action? In other words, issues of both Aqidah and Sharia. Ah, or does it mandate action without certain knowledge, meaning the Sharia ah, but without the Aqidah? What the majority of the knowledgeable among them say is that it mandates action but not certain knowledge. And that's again, يُجِبُ amal دُونَ ilm is what Al-Qurtubi said. And this is the opinion of Al-Shafi'i and the majority of the scholars of fiqh, end quote. However, there are also exceptions here, with some positing that a sahih ahad hadith can establish religious rules only if it is not contradicted by another hadith of similar or greater strength, or if it is not contradicted by the action of the people of Medina, remember, for example, this was the position of Imam Malik and the Maliki Madhab, with the rationale that the people of Medina in classical times as a collective learned their practice directly from the Prophet and carried on uh, that practice. The Hanafi school of thought, as you remember, also places some constraints on the use of Ahad Hadiths in terms of logical consistency, and we explored some of these issues in more detail when we discuss the use of reason in the application of hadiths. Now this topic sometimes engenders heated feelings, with some claiming that the ahad hadiths provide certain knowledge, and feeling again that they're defending the sunnah against those who would like to ignore it. This of course is a twisting of the facts and of the debate. Those students interested in assessing the opinion of our scholars on this topic are referred to the thorough online two-part article in the journal al wai the September and October 2018 issues, issues 384 and 385, by Abu Ubaida uh, Muawiyah al-Hijji. These articles are in Arabic, but the translation of their title is, quote, the majority of Islamic scholars, colon, ahad hadiths do not achieve certainty. In the syllabus, we've translated a couple of quotes from this source to give you a flavor of what the scholars have said. 
uh, for example, uh, Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi, who died in 429 Hijri. And you notice that I switch back and forth between the Hijri dates and the Western or Gregorian calendar to make us sort of comfortable with both. And if you remember, the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, uh, did the Hijra uh, 13 years after his mission began. So he was born in the year 570. He became a prophet when he was 40 years old. So that would be roughly the year 610. Now there's a difference between the lunar calendar and, and the solar calendar, etc. 13 years after that would be 623 then add 429 years to that to get a rough estimate, okay? So um, you know then that Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi lived in the 11th century uh, of the Western calendar. So now in his book, Usul al-Din, or the Foundations of the Faith, the Ahad narrations, he says, quote, the Ahad narrations, if they have sahih isnads and their metn is not untenable according to reason, obligate action though not knowledge, in other words, not belief. And it holds the same status as the testimony of righteous witnesses, since the ruler makes obligatory judgments on its apparent contents, although he is not certain of its veracity. It is with this kind of narration that most scholars have established the peripheral rulings in Sharia in both the ibadat, acts of worship, and mu'amalat, dealings between people, and the rest of the areas of halal and haram, and those who deny the obligation of acting on the Ahad narrations in Toto have erred. So what uh, the scholar uh, Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi is saying is basically what we've been saying, is that Sahih Ahad hadiths are like the testimony of witnesses in court, even though the judge may not be absolutely certain, it gives enough of a preponderance of opinion that he makes his ruling on that basis, so we use it to establish the Sharia, the rules of action, both in ibadat and in mu'amalat, um, both in the acts of worship and the dealings, and the halal and the haram, but we do not use it for the core beliefs that if somebody says, I deny this belief, then we say, thank you very much, God bless you, but you're not a Muslim anymore. Now, another scholar also named al-Baghdadi, but this time al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, in his book Al-Kifaya fi Ilm al riwaya The Sufficient in the Sciences of Narration, he has a heading titled, colon, mentioning and discrediting the false notion of those who claim that Ahad narrations obligate knowledge. Now, that, that really says it all. I don't need to go through the rest of his quote for you. You'll find it in the syllabus. But once again, phrases like obligate knowledge mean form the foundations of the articles of belief. Um, and he also says, by the way, in the quote that's in your syllabus, is that singular narrations are not accepted, quote, in contradiction to the rule of reason, the rule of the muhkam or unequivocal Quran, the known sunnah, and so forth. And he again says in his book, Al-Faqih wal mutafaqih the scholar and those who seek scholarship, that Ahad narrations mentioned in the Sahih books of Sunnah obligate knowledge, obligate action, forgive me, but do not obligate knowledge. Tujibu al-amal wa la tujibu al-ilm. So this makes the point that we've been making, justifies why we take the position we take in this course. And you can see, by the way, as a side benefit, the emphasis of the scholars that the hadiths not contradict reason. That appears in, in both of the quotes of both Imams al-Baghdadi, and that relates back to our earlier discussion showing that our late classical scholars, unlike much of the modern discourse, definitely believed in bringing reason to bear on hadiths. So then, the majority opinion among the scholars seems to be that ahad hadiths are used as foundational in establishing rules of sharia, but not in establishing the core of aqidah. We keep drumming this point over and over so that it is very clear. And now, now that that point is clear, so similar to what was noted in the section on their use in aqidah, there's also a minority opinion regarding their role in sharia. 
which is that if the hadith is ahad and gharib, meaning that at at least one node in the chain of transmission, it goes down to only one narrator, it should not be used in sharia. The reasoning here is that if the hadith has come through only one line of transmission, it doesn't represent certain knowledge at all. And the example given by some scholars is that adjudication about small sums of money, for example, if two Muslims agree, disagree about 10 dirhams, then this would require two witnesses in court for the judge to rule who the dirhams belong to. And as stated by Professor Kamali, quote, some ulama have rejected it. By it here, we mean the notion that a singular transmission can be used for making laws. On the basis of an analogy, they have drawn with a provision of the law of evidence, namely that the testimony of one witness falls short of legal proof. Therefore, according to this point of view, it is not reasonable to obligate the entire body of Muslims forever to a religious rule based on a single chain of narration, particularly when that rule may involve, for example, criminal penalties or corporal punishment. Therefore, in this opinion, the Ahad Hadiths need to have multiple chains of narration, be more than gharib, acknowledging, of course, that these hadiths have not reached mutawatir status, or other corroboration from the Qur'an or generally accepted practice among the Muslims to be a source of religious law. We lean toward this point of view because it seems to make tremendous sense, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now, um, we had discussed an example hadith earlier. Let's reiterate it here. That would be the hadith about actions or by intentions. And we talked about the majority view that when you begin to do an act of worship, for example, you should intend it for it to count. So if you're going to do wudu, you say, I intend to do wudu, then you wash yourself and that makes it your wudu. If you go swimming without any sort of intention and then get out of the pool, and then say, oh, well, I was in the water, so everything got washed, now I can do my prayers. For the majority of schools of thought, that doesn't count, because actions are by their intention, and you never intended for your wudu when you go swimming. Therefore, by the way, when you get in the pool, you can just say, hey, I intend wudu, or in the shower, hey, I intend wudu. Now, the Hanafi school, as you remember, and we talked about this before at length, so I'll just remind you briefly, says, no, this hadith is gharib. Its first node, uh, it, uh, well, the node closest to the Prophet, peace be upon him, that, for that particular hadith, it was Umar ibn al-Khattab. The second node, the third node, they're all singular. Therefore, we cannot use this hadith to obligate all the Muslims. And in the Hanafi madhab, if you go swimming, if you accidentally fall into the water, whatever it may be, you can be considered to have your wudu. And we'll leave that up to you but we just wanted to give you a sense of how th these things play out. So this lecture is not uh, as long as some, but I think it is a good point to stop here because it does tackle a very important topic and we kind of don't want to dilute the emphasis uh, by going into another topic. So next lecture, inshallah, we will uh, begin tackling some of the other very important topics in hadith application. As always, thank you for your attention with us. Thank you for taking this course. We hope that you're enjoying it and learning something from it. God bless, and we'll see you in the next lecture, inshallah. Salaamu alaikum.